To get started, I wanted to put this event in context with uh, who's organizing it and so forth. So a bit of intro. So the Chicago Artist Coalition, for those who don't know, it's a nonprofit organization here in Chicago that supports contemporary Chicago artists and curators by offering residency programs, exhibitions, professional development, and resources that enable them to live, work, and thrive in the city. Uno Uriabachi, who is here and is the artist that's with us this afternoon, is one of the hatched residents at the Chicago Artists Coalition, and I happen to be one of the resident curators who curated the show, Excavating Memory. Uni Miyabashi Udo works across various mediums, including textile, prints, artist books, and computer games. In an attempt to bring to light and make peace with an idea of the void, their experience centers on surface and absence, text as image, redaction, redundancy, blackness as color, and construct. Udo holds an MFA in Visual Communication Design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in Architecture from Columbia University. Delindia Collier, who we have here with us, and I'm so grateful you accepted uh, to join us this afternoon. Delinda Collier is an Associate Professor of Art History at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she teaches and researches Southern African art an alternative history of new media technologies. She's the author of Re Repainting the Walls of Luanda, Information, Colonialism, and Angolan Art, 2016, and Media Primitivism, Technical Art in Africa. She's published several articles in Enca Contemporary Art Journal, Third Text, African Arts Critical Interventions, Journal of African Art, History, and Visual Culture, Art South Africa, London Review of Books. And so we have these two delightful individuals here to join in the conversation. So why the question, why, why this, the impetus to make these works uh, at this time? Well, I had been thinking about these themes, um, looking at my museum colonialism, alienation, and family history for a while. And I'd been wanting to expand on the work that I did for my master's thesis at uh, SAIC, which was an installation called My Country. And so making this work was sort of a way to work through those ideas in a little bit more depth or from like a different angle. And so, how is this work different from your previous work? Because I know you've done some work that had to do with the making, I feel, of African masks and pedestals on which you had nothing on them. Like, how does this work relate to that body of work? Okay, yeah, so that, um, that piece of that work, which is my thesis, um, my country, parentheses, object removed for study, was an installation piece looking at the sort of a juxtaposition of family, of a family history, um, my own family history, as it parallels the journey of many African artifacts. So moving from Nigeria to the UK to the US. And in that installation, I was looking as I am um, in these works in the way that museums, specifically the British Museum, categorize works um, and categorize, in categorizing works, categorize people. And so I look at that installation as the, at the time, I guess, the summation of what I was thinking up until that point, but also a launching point of my trying to work more um, on more personal themes, because that's something that I haven't brought as explicitly into my work before. My process is kind of boring. I sort of click through <laughs> the British Museum's website, uh, which loads very slowly. It crashed like every other time I reloaded it. <laughs> um, looking through the British Museum's website, um, specifically looking at their 
archival photographs of colonial Nigeria because I had decided that I wanted to focus on that aspect. Um, for now, looking at the, before I was looking at the works in the museum, now I wanted to look at the depiction of the land and of the people more directly. And so I was going through that, going through my own younger brother's photos. He shares, he takes and shares a lot of photos with our family. And I went through the albums that he would share with us of photos from New England, from the Midwest, and a couple from Florida. He went on like a spring break with his friends. <laughs> Um, and then looking at materials and processes that I'm interested in, really interested in reflection and in surfaces. And I'm always looking for ways to incorporate text into my work because text is very important to me. And so I pretty much just look at all of this stuff and try to figure out what I can achieve technically and how I can bring these elements together in a way that makes sense for what I'm trying to convey but that I can also do more or less with my own hands. And so the, I wanted to bring Delinda in, in now to talk about sort of, because one of the, one of the things that spawned um, the way this event was curated was the idea of stories and narratives and the way Uno has talked about wanting to tell a personal narrative through her work, but also in looking in terms of how, um, the, the narrative around African art in the world of art history and sort of, you know, museums or places where, you know, collective histories are stored and so forth. And what do you find to be problematic in that regard? When we look at sort of African art history, can you do, have I not on oh, Yeah, you need to unmute Delinda. <laughs> I'm sorry. There you I think when we muted ourselves, we couldn't unmute. I'm sorry. Um, there you can are. you hear me? Okay. Yes. I think I did that. That was my fault. Um, Problem. No, this is really great to hear Uno talk about the work because what I kind of notice um, with a lot of it is is you know your interest in institutional norms and um, how those things the things that we somehow take for granted like text and pedestals and um, the actual format of institutions you're really laying bare, right? And um, part of that, I think, is to point to this very huge problem of, of the institutional history of this, of this art. And, and so um, when one kind of talks about African art, it's uh, nearly impossible uh, to not see it through that lens, to the, see it through that, uh, you know, the history of its collection and the history of its um, different ways of getting to other places, you know, and of course the the biggest kind of most egregious thefts, um, as you mentioned, being uh, kind of housed in the British Museum, you know, um, and so that's that's what strikes me about your work is that is that it's not just about the art it's really about the institution and and um and putting a square frame on that as a site of loss and as a site of intervention of where um you know those stories happen in the show if you saw in the video um or in person if you managed to make it to the space before the lockdown or if you you know live in chicago there, I created a series of works that um, they're called them like photo assemblages. They combine a photo text from that comes from the descriptive text or sort of accessibility text from photos in the British Museum, a screen of two-way mirror film, and then a photograph that I've taken from my younger brother's photo albums. And so the photo in that image which bears the text, if I remember correctly, view of a river in forest, is of my parents, um, and my, they just joined, hello family, um, <laughs> my parents' yard waste bin in, um, in their yard in Indiana. And as a photograph, I just find it very amusing. <laughs> And many of the photos that I was going through in the British Museum's archive were less amusing, either 
they were like some of the other photographs whose captions I've used um, were either images like active images of conquest. One was from the burning of Erechuku during the Aero expedition, which is one of the major um, so-called punitive expeditions where the British um, raised civilizations and stole um, artifacts and works of art. And so a lot of the images that I was dealing with were distressing either for their implications um, or their actual content. And I wanted to juxtapose them with images that were very far removed in terms of being situated in, in America, sort of bucolic American scenes, sometimes just amusing or mm -hmm. incredibly banal American scenes, but they're tied together in that these photo, the photos that I was looking for um, and looking at at the British Museum are taken in the area that my family is from, southeastern Nigeria. And the photos with which I'm pairing their captions are taken by a Nigerian who has never been to that region, in a, but in the location which he did grow up. When we think of African art in, in museum spaces, a lot of the times people either see these objects as sort of like objects contained in glass as objects in and of themselves, um, somehow absolutely disconnected from sort of the, the social world that they came from and so forth. So in, in putting together African art history, how can you look at African art objects and have them completely devoid from the context that they're in and the way you talk about them? Um, and I feel like in many ways, Uno's world is, Uno's work is somehow problematizing that, right? The way it's represented in museums and the work in the context that it lived in before it got to the museum, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and this is the kind of the, one of the origin questions or problems of our field um, is, is, again, um, not being able to ignore that institutional history and all of the things that it's tied to. Um, but then, you know, even in the most benign cases of African art being there, it's just like any other art object being in a museum, it's doing something totally different, right? Um, you can say that of a lot of uh, uh, things that are, are in the museum, but with this, um, you know, body of African art, we have that added burden or the added um, history of the trauma that's associated with it. And, and so it's, you're having to ne negotiate both things in this regard. And I think that's what Uno's work is really um, getting to so aptly. It's, um, it's really talking about uh, the duality of that problem of not just a museification of art, but, but of the history and the associations of that institution um, with that. So yeah, I think a question that curators always ask themselves and, and have a multitude of opinions about is how to reframe that work within the museum. Because when you walk into the gallery, you see this 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 uh, black sand in the middle of the gallery, contained with a, you know like a you know a bowl and so forth. And for many people, it seemed inexplicable unless you knew what the title of it was. Um, how is that piece uh, relevant to the rest of the work that you have in the show? I think that piece is a little bit uh, different from the rest of the work in that it's not looking so explicitly at Africa or at museums, but it's tied more to this idea of landscape that I ended up thinking of a lot while going through my brother's photographs and looking at photos of Nigerian, Nigerian landscapes as captured by um, early 20th century, late 19th century colonists. And I'm generally really interested in um, like feudal gestures and the visualization of lack and trying to do something that you can't do. And I had been wanting to make this piece for a while and to see how it played in conversation with work that was more, um, I think specifically content driven and so the piece, as Joel described, is 120 pounds of black sand, which is less sand than you'd think it is, given, <laughs> given its weight. <laughs> um, 
but you wanted more. <laughs> yeah, I wanted, I wanted more. And I, um, I did, like, there are websites where you can calculate how much sand covers square footage for people who want to build sandboxes. And so I take away from all of this that I learned is that, like, Smithson was a very rich man. Sand is very expensive. <laughs> But I had been interested in this sort of a new way, um, trying to move more into installation, but new ways of sort of visualizing nothing, visualizing an attempt. Um, so in the title, a well, it's like obviously it's either a dry well or a well of sand. You're not going to be able to get water from it. Um, the black sand is actually, interestingly, a lot of black sand is actually coal ash, which I think also then ties back into fossil, like fossil fuel, fuels, um, resource extraction, which although unintentional does then tie back with issues that have faced uh, specifically like Sub-Saharan Africa since colonization. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because one of the, on these different cards, you have portrait of my brother as a cow, portrait of my brother as a full American. And I think the list is actually about 30 different things. Yeah. Why would you say portrait of my brother as a full American and then another one that says portrait of my brother as a cow? Like those- a Miniature cow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so in my thesis work and in some of the work leading up to it, I'd been thinking of my brother as a kind of avatar for some of the objects that I encountered in museums, specifically in the Art Institute, um, the Art Institute of Chicago here. There's a piece in the African galleries, it's an altar head for an oba, which if you're not familiar with, these are uh, bronze heads. Their uh, portrait busts that were generally sculpted in the likeness of a deceased king of the Benin kingdom and then put on a family altar. And these are sort of the some of the foremost objects that were stolen uh, during the looting and burning of the Benin kingdom and are kind of figureheads of the repatriation effort. But knowing that this um, this was actually a person, it's like an image of a person. This is an embodiment of an ancestor. I sort of felt like it must be lonely in the museum. And also thinking of my, my younger brother who lives quite far away from me and my do miss. I don't know if he's on the call yet, but he can hear this and be a little embarrassed. Um, and so it was, feeling the sort of identification between my brother and this altar head um, in particular. And then looking at my brother as a family relationship um, that sort of serves as a cipher for feelings of kinship, the feelings of kinship I feel with some of these objects in the museum and with my family members, it's a kinship that resists fully identif identifying with the other. Um, my brother is like me, but he's not me. Mm -hmm. And so that's why um, personally, that sort of, that level of personalization, it's personal, but it's still, there's still a level of distance. And in this piece, Portrait of My Brother, which exists as an interactive text piece, which as the gallery is currently closed and you can't access the iPad, I've actually put it up on my website. Um, so if anyone, find the link to my website, I'll put it somewhere. <laughs> or you can just um, link to your website. Oh yeah, I can, yeah, I can, I'll put it in the chat and you can play the game. I think of them as text games. Uh, that is Portrait of My Brother. And I also created a series of takeaway cards that have each of the phrases for visitors and gallery to take with them. And I was thinking of, again, describing a thing um, describing a person, describing a relationship without all the ways that you can describe something that give a full, like, an expansive picture, but not a complete one. Mm -hmm. Because 
even though these all might be facets of my brother, of how I view my brother or view my own relationship to him and so my relationship to my identity, they still don't quite get at like, sort of the essence, which is the thing that I still struggle to grasp. And so, and so your work, so this is one of the things like when I was hearing this show with both you and Katie, I felt like the, the, the link between both of you is, or both of your work and yours in particular is something for, that's also personal. And the reason why the show is called Excavating Memory is because there's so much that needs to be pulled to the surface that, and I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you was a sense of invisibility, um, the subtext of all of this is the invisibility of African art and the stories embodied in these different objects um, that are not there um, and your work um, as a way of creating its own separate story, right? Yeah, I think it's invisibility, but even more so sort of alienation. Um, it's being very visible, but not being seen but also maybe it's sort of a denial of seeing, maybe you don't want to be seen if you're under the circumstances under which you're going to be viewed. Right. Um, okay, um, Delinda, can I ask you, since I've not had an opportunity to do so yet, to tell me a little bit about, um, about your work and particularly around this notion of media primitivism and what, yeah, that, sure. what that is. Yeah, it's, well, it's so interesting. I'm like furiously writing down what I'm saying because it's, um, I love this notion of, of art as, as familial in this way. Um, but it strikes me that, that you said that, you know, it's, it's sort of when you know somebody as well as you know a brother, um, but, but even a brother, somebody who's as close to you as that, um, you don't fully know them. Right, and there's something in that that I think I'm always kind of reaching for in this term media primitivism, which is to say that that um, that all of us kind of desire for art to return to that place where it's mediating, right? And where it's not, you know, the thing with African art is that it's always been, or since it's been collected into museums, it's taken on this function as being evident. Yes. And that's, so that's one of the things that I talk about under this term media primitivism um, is, is a gesture against African art serving as evidence because it's precisely like you were saying, Uno, it's not just the art that's acting as evidence, it's the actual people who made it that become evidence too. And that's when it becomes, you know, racism essentially, um, but also a part of a whole host of other problematic, um, you know, uses and exploitations and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, the, the book was, and this book is just about to come out, but it was, it was attempting to get back to some of these original dreams and fantasies that we've had for art, you know, that isn't just for African art, but for all of art, which is that it's, it's serving something um, nearly approaching a mystery, but it functions in a way that we fully can't comprehend or, or characterize at any one moment, but it's acting in a potent way as a mediator between people and, um, you know, for whatever purpose, um, sometimes it's purposeless, you know, um, but, but it has this kind of more sacred um, part in society. There is a well-known um, African curator who passed away last year. Yeah. And um, he used to uh, write a lot in the Enca Journal as well. And I, I remember reading an article, his name escapes me right now, but I'll- Oh, Gwen Wazer. Yes, that's him. And one of the things he talks about, he talks about the idea of, um, is that African art is seen as completely sort of ahistoric, not moving haven't evolved, isn't really modern, because in many ways the West has kind of frozen it in the glass case in the museum. 
-hmm. And I feel in many ways, some of Uno's work is sort of like taking it out the glass, putting it in the middle of the floor, uh, <laughs> literally. And, um, and that tension in sort of keeping it in this airtight space is in a way of saying that sort of Africa has not evolved or have not moved. Uh, and the art itself as it exists hasn't either. And if it does, it's seen as somehow mimicking Western art influences in their work as opposed to their own sort of trajectory. Um, what are your thoughts about that, Delinda? Oh, um, well, for me, yeah, that's... <laughs> Um, I'll have that so jump in. Yeah, that's been the central, that's been this, again, a field defining central problem is that, um, is that the, you know, the advent of, of the field of African art history. Um, and again, I want to always keep that separate from what African art is or how it exists, you know, separate from the field. But in the field of African art history, you know, this, this had its formations in discourses of science. And so it wasn't interested in history. It was interested, again, in African art serving as evidence of a civilization. And the claim being made from the Enlightenment forward was that Africans had no history, right? And, um, and again, this is a product of racism. Um, it's, it's, um, and it was a way of kind of saying that not only do Africans not have history, but they are the prehistory of, of Europeans. Right, um, and so it was this kind of um, idea about the development of certain um, species and humans, and you know, all kinds of um, kind of warped things. So, so when in the 20th century there was a drive to sort of um, revisit that and to change it and to fix it, uh, you know, there were all kinds of attempts, and and I think some more successful than others, to go back and to look at those records and to say, okay, how do we now historicize this properly, and to make sure that we're being careful about specifically where and when certain objects occur, um, and as well, kind of building this other kind of overlay of the colonial history on top of it, which is what I referred to earlier as kind of the double burden of the field, right? to account not just for the art, but also <laughs> the colonial history of, of its taking. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's still an ongoing project that many people are um, much more successful at than others. And that is to, to, um, to do things in a way that's more responsible, but also not totally reliant on Western um, institutional norms. I was doing research uh, for my MFA piece, looking again at other museum collections, looking at the non-art museum uh, approach to African art and African artifacts. And the Field Museum is really wild. Um, and you kind of have to see it for yourself, but I almost want to tell you not to give them your money because their admissions is pretty expensive and the gallery is very offensive. <laughs> but you're led through, like you enter um, and you're greeted at the entrance to the African gallery at the Field Museum or African Wing, I'm not sure if you right to call the gallery, um, by a life-size black and white photo cut out of a woman um, from, I think Molly and she's wearing like a wrapper, but she's carrying a Louis Vuitton bag. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and you sort of go through it. The first part is sort of an interactive kids bit about what do you, um, like it's a feast day. What do you, um, this is what we do on this feast day. And it's clearly set in the, like the eighties, nineties, because all of the photos, they have all these life size black and white photo color and cutouts of people. And the guys have like flat tops and there'll be some, like some Western gear. I think you see a Chicago Bulls jersey somewhere and their little placards like, oh, how do Africans make, to, like, Africans make tea a special way? Spoiler, it's by boiling leaves in water. Same way everybody else makes tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but from there you move into, uh, and there's, again, there's not dates on anything. And from there you move into 
uh, galleries or like little rooms that are just looking at the like, different regions. And they have just a bunch of artifacts. None of them are dated. Um, and so you compared, and especially paired with the room you came in before, you're sort of when were these objects made versus these, con or at the time, contemporary people celebrating a holiday. Um, all, all the while, um, the wall text are sort of asking you, because again, it's very clearly aimed at young children, um, asking you, oh, how many African countries can you name, et cetera, et cetera. But the really wild twist is that once you've made it through North Africa and the sort of bizarre scene, you arrive at, um, at this little like interstitial hallway where, and I can't remember the exact, their exact phrasing, but it's something very close to like Africans used to be, um, used to be thought like, very like highly skilled etc and they sort of show you a map of colonial colonial conquest and if you follow the path of the exhibition and don't go through the like the door that looks like a fire door it leads you onto a replica slave ship and you come out the other side and are wow. greeted by a didactic that says first they were africans then they were slaves takes you through really quickly through slavery and the civil rights movement and ends with a full color, um, as opposed to the black and white cutouts before, a full color life-size cutout of a like, very Cosby, fa um, Cosby family-esque, like 90s African-American family. And so you've, pretty much what you've learned from this gallery is that Africans maybe existed in some kind of like prehistoric, ahistoric path, past, but then they all became slaves and it was very sad, but we're going to kind of move through that very quickly. And now they're happy, well-adjusted middle-class African-Americans. Like, well, this seems offensive to everyone involved. Amnesia is so present in the title of this talk is because I feel like there's, um, is it selective amnesia? Uh, who controls the narrative? Uh, history with a capital H or is it history plural and how do we negotiate those stories are everyone you know you know Uno is creating her own narrative as an artist creating her own story through the work that she does when you look at cultural institutions like museum spaces um, where there's such a, where there's where you were those issues of amnesia? It may be whoever the curator is, just like at the Field Museum, in this day and age, you would never assume that such a curation would be still possible. And I don't know if Uno wrote them a letter or an email, but the idea is somehow that, is the, is the institution of museums so, there's kind of a sclerosis where folks, things are just, fixed the way they are, and that's just the way they've functioned for a very long time, and to institute change would, re would force too much of a change of the narrative on which so much is built upon, right, about who's modern and who's not modern. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't know what's happening at the Field Museum in terms of its curatorship over that collection. Mm -hmm. I suspect it hasn't been changed in many, many, many years. Yeah, that's um, the same it's been my whole, I remember going, I remembered seeing similar things as a child, and so I don't think it's changed. Yeah, since right, it's and so I don't, you know, um, I can't speak to what's happening at, at the institution. Oh, here's Mark answering. The field exhibition has not changed since the early 90s. Yeah, yes. that's, that's what I figured, and I know that they've had um, kind of a, a moving cast of characters who are in charge of the Africa collection, but um, but it's also, I mean, at this point, might as well just like save it as an exhibition of something else, right? Something that right. they were not intending, but as the exhibition of a particular way of thinking about Africa. Um, because, and then I'm seeing on, on Liz's comment here, there's also the issue of, of many of these institutions refusing to see Egypt as part of the continent. Right. And, and I think I remember, because it's been a long time now since I've been to the exhibition and the field, but at a certain point during, 
it might be in the Egypt galleries that says Egypt is in Africa. It has to remind us, you know, um, because instit again, institutionally, Egyptology has been so separate from um, African studies, you know, and, um, and there, there are implications of that that go well beyond um, just, you know, who does which work on it, but it goes to those very questions about who has a history, you know, who's assumed to have a history. Um, and, you know, it, and it, you know, of course, spills over into also the way people are racialized and, and kind of conjugated in that way. So do you think, um, do you think it's a uh, laziness on the part of historians? And I see that someone has asked a question too, when we consider the practice of ethnographic collection at the base of Western, yes. Can everybody see that? Or would you all like me to read it? Can you read it? I don't see yeah, that. Yeah, I can read it. Okay. So it's a question for both participants. When we consider the practice of ethnographic collection at the base of Western institutions, such as the one here discussed, this practice is rooted in colonial use of standardization and cataloging of other cultures. What are alternative practices for collection and exhibition of non-Western artifacts that, that, can, that can counter colonialism-based practices with non-Western ones? Do you want to go, Uno? Oh, yeah, you go, you go ahead. Uh, oh. I mean, I, I know that there are a lot of people thinking, I mean, I it, it would, it would, you'd be hard pressed to find a curator of African art who's not thinking about these issues um, and trying to figure out ways of, of um, doing better by the work. I think what a lot of institutions are doing is to try thematic change and to lump in maybe a medium type together, like ceramics from all over the world over here. Um, another would be just using plain old chronology you know, and going back and like feeding more objects into the chronology. Um, and, you know, and so it, it depends on the size of the institution. For, for instance, at the Art Institute, you know, there's just kind of a, um, a, a setup and an architecture that comports with the bureaucracy of that institution that's very, very hard to change. And so you have on the front lines of these things, I think more college um, art museums who are doing more exciting things because they're more nimble and right. they don't have as many people to, and you know, again, the architecture kind of is, is of the sort where you have like the central part of the museum is, is the European stuff and everything on the periphery is, is the non-Western stuff. And so ethnography, ethnographic museum becomes sort of old dinosaurs. Yeah, and okay. ethnography so was a way, remember ethnography was a way also of trying to correct that, that original theft. It was attempting to fill in what had been traumatically lost with that removal of the object. So at the time, it felt like the right thing to do, which was to build up a lot of context around this work. And that's why we have something called the field and, and field work. It was to attempt to rebuild that lost context, right? Um, and now, and, and there were debates at the time about whether or not that was ever going to be good enough. Obviously, it's not, you know? Um, and so there, there's also a lot of thinking there. Right. Uno, did you want to say anything about, about that or...? Yeah, and I think this, um, I saw Naeem just posted a question as well that I think. Yeah, it's um, a great question. Builds on this one and sort of also leads into what I was going to say. Um, the question, it's in the chat, but I'll read it out loud. Um, it's museums, particularly encyclopedic museums, were formed during the height of colonialism. Our history, too, was established during colonialist expansion and increased nation building. Given these histories and frames of reference, do you think it's possible to exhibit so-called non-Western art in museums without essentializing or ghettoizing the object of histories? And, and from my point of view, which I also realize is unlikely, given how that I don't run a single museum, not one, <laughs> but <laughs> there's part of me that says, you know, just send everything back. But I also realize that a lot of things have no place to return to now, and that's because the original context in which they lived were lost. And that's something that I also 
um, sort of trying to work through in my, my own recent work, this feeling of displacement. But in terms of ghettoizing, what I, what I find myself focusing on a lot at museums, again, is evidenced in my work, is the text around, around collections, the didactics, uh, the explanatory um, and wall text that you see in galleries. And so what would it be like to go to an African gallery without them showing you a map of Africa mm -hmm. as soon as you walk in? Like, oh, yeah. this is a gallery of African art. It's art like any other. Or failing that, why not, if, like, if you're not going to stop ghettoizing or stop being very ethno like ethnographic for non-Western art, sort of um, undo the ghettoization by, in, again, a bit of a troll move, but making all of the Western art have to bear the same brunt of ethnography, like going into the Impressionist gallery and reading a plaque about how baling hay was very important, which is why you see all of these paintings mm -hmm. that Monet did. Yes. Else. Yeah. Very important to Europeans that they have bales of hay. Yeah. It switches the gaze, actually, and makes it seem like you're not studying that the others the other is also being studied as well it's the idea of being studied that i feel like your work especially the one with the photographs is really sort of tapping into because there's a there's a lens that's being focused on the on whoever's being viewed and whoever is behind that lens there's a sort of power dynamics that not that's not at all very equal which is why it feels that way so the idea of going into a museum and of a European painter and describing it in very ethnographic terms, people would think you're joking. Of course not. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't describe it in such a manner. Correct, Delinda? Am I yeah. wrong? No. And, and you know what? One of the things that I semi joke with my colleagues about, but I'm actually kind of serious, is that like in, in our institution, when we teach art history, I think if you only talk about art from America and Europe, you should call it, you shouldn't call it the survey of whatever you should call it <laughs> the survey of north american and north atlantic art and you should be specific we should ghettoize everybody yeah. everything should be hyper specific and i will say that because i know that yale recently scrapped their survey art history course because they felt like right and comprehensive but so I went to Columbia, which also has a survey art history class, but they at least were straightforward thing. It's Western art history. It's yes. Western music. Yeah. If you want to learn about Africa, you have to take a global core. <laughs> yeah. Which, and, you know, I think there's just a general, there's been such a huge sea change in the field. And just in the past five to 10 years, I've seen this become just the norm where people are realizing they cannot teach um, in the same ways that they've been teaching. Museums know that they can't present in the same ways that they've been presenting. Um, it's not only uh, just not politically correct, but they just know it's like not, it's just not in any way correct, right? And it's not reflective of the society that we live in with, um, you know, just take for instance, this platform where we have people from all over the world tuning in. And it's just very normal to speak of a global art where, where we all kind of can share a platform. Um, and I just think that normalizing of um, all of us as being hyper-specific is one of the ways that we can get through um, or find new ways of, of displaying that on an institutional level too. But I wanted to thank you all. It's already 6.30. And so I'm gonna formally uh, end this meeting. This is my very first one, so. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you. Thank everyone. you everyone. Thank you for your Thank questions. You. Thank you for being a part of it and look out for the next one that's going to be happening, like I said, on the 29th with Katie Chung's work, which is going to look very much on sort of uh, Korean American identity. Um, oh, great. The, yes, that's it. Thank you, guys. Great. I appreciate Bye. it. Thank you. Good to Have see a you good all. Evening. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye.